Um, good morning and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, we are convening the meeting of the uh, County Transportation Commission uh, on January 16th, 1920 at 9 o'clock. Uh, Kirk, please call the roll. 2020. Yes. yes. Commissioner Lowe. Here. Commissioner Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. Commissioner Caput. Here. Commissioner Kuhn, uh, Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Alternate Mulhern. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commission Alternate Lynn. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. And Commissioner Watkin. Here. Very good. Um, welcome to everyone. Um, we will. I uh, now open uh, for the number two item on the agenda for oral communications. Anyone that would like to address us on issues that are not on the agenda, for three, talk to us for three minutes about their concerns. Welcome. How do I do the... Oh, I press it? Uh, all right, you're going to make me work. I'm up. You now have two, hour, two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that to me. Oh, ow. <laughs> new chair, new room. Actually, Bruce, you're not that mean to me. And your voice is loud enough. You don't need that thing. Oh, come on. All right. Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, the photo that's showing up there is uh, Zach Friend uh, opening up the Valencia Road. It was closed for months a few years ago. And the main point we're trying to emphasize here is that was a key transportation connector. What a transportation connector is, is it's that vital road that connects neighborhoods or pathways that is basically the shortest distance to those neighborhoods. And they're key. Um, Valencia Road is a great example of it. And when one of those key transportation corridors are shut down, it changes the whole dynamics of traffic in the region. Um, everybody had to go down SoCal Highway 1. My wife, who's a kindergarten teacher there had to go all the way around. So it really impacts the regional transportation issue. And that's a, a great example of a key transportation corridor. The Santa Cruz Coastal Trail is the same thing. It's a key transportation corridor. Unfortunately, most people don't realize it because they're not using it. But when they do, they'll realize the value because the study showed 15,000 people a day would be using that corridor compared to of course, the train, which was less than 2,000 a day. So most important thing about where we're at with the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail is it's closed, and it's basically are closed for exclusive government usage in the future. And that's where we're, we're frustrated a little bit in the sense that this key transportation corridor is, needs to be open as soon as possible and we believe that it will change our dynamics. Now, unfortunately, Zach's not here. Um, and we want to point out that Zach actually, and he'll probably get mad for me for saying this, but he quit this organization, essentially quit it because of his, his philosophies of financial. Zach's a great supervisor. Uh, he, he's very disciplined in financials. He's very good at public policy. Um, because he understands what will work and what does not. Granted, he lives 500 feet from the railroad, and so if we think about it, if we think about the efforts that this organization is doing in the way of the investments and planning, you have one of the most well-known supervisors who doesn't support a train, 60 trains a day. And the reason he really doesn't accept it is because it will shut down Aptos Village. Every 15 minutes, if we have a train going through there, there's no train station in the village. So we're asking for us to begin using this key transportation corridor and think about why Zach Friend is not on the board and he's quit. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I represent, I'm Grace Voss, and I represent the Santa Cruz County Cycling Club. And I'm speaking uh, this morning on the need to retain the bicycle lane in Aptos Village on the north side of the road. And it's there for the safety of bicyclists that are traveling westbound. 
Every other Tuesday, the Santa Cruz County Cycling Club has an organized ride that leaves from Rancho Del Mar Shopping Center, and usually we head out through the village and into the South County to ride the rural roads, which are beautiful. And then we come back and we use that side of Aptos Village, the north side, and that bike lane. So we want to retain that bike lane, not surrender it for a sidewalk, which is what the county has proposed and it's there now, we need it. Uh, it's true, we do have to merge with traffic right before the bridge, but before the bridge, it gives us an extra element of safety. And what our county needs is more bicycle lanes, not, not eliminating bike lanes. Thank you. Pardon? No, she's our staff. Oh, she just oh, put your. Staff. <laughs> oh, I would like you guys to uh, look at the screens. This is like reading fast forward because I don't have very much time. Here's my question. Is a $11 million, 1.2-mile uh, segment, 18 rail, rail trail wise, next? Oh, oh, I get the clip. Okay. So we need to know that the MBSST was rerouted on uh, because they couldn't get across the Watsonville Slough or the Harkin Slough or even run along the Slough, Galligan Slough. Um, it was rerouted onto San Andreas, onto West Beach. Those are at 45 miles per hour, so it's a bike-only route. So it comes along San Andreas and heads up West Beach into Watsonville. So here's what the map looks like. You're going along Watsonville, uh, uh, West Beach, and instead of heading straight into Watsonville, they're going to reroute it onto Lee Road, onto the, the rail corridor. And that is, it will be a bicycle-only trail, okay? It will not be a pedestrian trail. But there are better paths that already exist. Please look at this map very closely. The proposed trail is about 400 feet from a walking trail and about 300 feet from an existing bike lane. The bike lane is on West Beach. I take it quite a bit. I've taken the slew paths. They're very pleasant. They are, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. This is what the Watson View uh, slew trail really looks like. On the right, our neighbor uh, is the back of uh, houses. So it, it integrates neighborhoods. Why spend $10.8 million on an unneeded bike path when you have both a trail on one side and a bike path on the other? And let me explain to you, here are your costs based on the estimate of the, one, the, uh, the Ohlone Parkway to the Watsonville Slough. The easiest part, the one uh, point, 1,500 feet, this is where this $10.8 million comes from. I use your numbers, not mine. This is what the view is going to look like if you build the rail trail. Okay, you will have a trail, but you're going to be looking at the backside of industrial stuff instead of the beautiful Watsonville Slough. Worse, you're going to have to add $2 million more because this doesn't include the cost of road crossings, or, and that's going to be contaminated, uh, con complicated with contaminated ground hazardous material removal, and you still don't own two parcels between Lee Road and Ohlone Road, okay? Uh, is there a better way to spend money? Yes, there is. You could use $50,000 instead to just protect the bike lanes on West Beach. I'm not going to tell you it's the prettiest bike lane in the world, but it is better than the, the rail corridor. You spend less than $50,000. That's the deluxe model. <coughs> uh, you could spend half a million to improve the pedestrian paths. This is actually the Watsonville uh, Slough Trail as well. Uh, let's keep Watsonville Trail attractive. Put money into improvement, not displacement. By the way, this is a view from uh, one of those Watsonville Slough Trails in that area. And then Watsonville has beautiful trails today. And then lastly, did you know that $10.8 million can buy a new highway lane? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Caput. Yeah, real quick, uh, you know, some, that makes sense. Uh, Maybe we should go and look at it. I don't know if you looked at that particular spot where he's talking about. Uh, it, 
they're they're very close the existing trail and the one we're proposing so um, <clears throat> maybe somebody from rtc can go down there and look at it i just went down and looked at it about two days ago because uh, i got the phone call so well i mean it, it's we the place of the commission would it? they like to have us uh the the staff review this at should be be fine. They don't think it would take that much time to that, do, and, okay. and then come back next month, and then let us know or give us an opinion of what your thoughts are on it. Cost. I would like to be part of that. I listened to this and I thought about it also. Excuse me. Okay. I guess it um, the city of Watsonville has already done the investment and the work on that and the segments and why some of the costs came up as a result of that. So the city of Watsonville has already approved this project and has started um, the work on this, this part of the segment. You're, you're talking about the ten point, uh, the $10 million? We're talking about the segment that's between Walker and Lee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, I mean, we, if we could look at it, it's, uh, they're, they're not even a block away from each other. The, what he's talking about and uh, what we're proposing. Might save some money is what I'm getting at. Um, okay. Maybe, uh, yes, yes, sir. Mr. I just want to chime in on that a little bit. I, I, you know, it's, sometimes we visualize things uh, and it, for simplicity and uh, for economic reasons, but if it happens that a, a pedestrian is hit on West Beach Street, because we didn't give an, uh, an, an access on a path or a, a bicyclist is hit on West Beach Street, and we didn't give it an alternate route for them to be on a safe route without no vehicles being close to them. I'd rather go that way than have to worry about that somebody got killed on West Beach Street uh, because there, there was more traffic there and there wasn't a... The yeah. <clears throat> is there a bike trail right now on West Beach? There's a bike path. There's just a bike path. path. Yeah. Could I uh, could probably raise a on point there. of order? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this yeah, is oral communications. Yeah. It's not on the agenda for yeah. discussion. I'm um, just going to direct the project. If if the commission wants to have it on the next agenda, I think that would be the appropriate time to talk about it. But uh, this isn't. I, I, I get it. I just okay. Uh, I just okay. want somebody to look at it. Okay, as I uh, asked our staff to do. Okay. Report back to us next week or next month, um, Mr. Helmer. Hi, Jim Helmer, one zero eight eight five Alba Road, Ben Lumen. Um, I'm here to um, ask that we pay closer attention to Assembly Bill twenty three sixty three. This is the zero fatalities task force that was established by law uh, through Assembly Member Friedman and signed into law by the governor. The California Transportation uh, State Transportation Agency has been holding public hearings for almost a year now. Their report to the Assembly is due this month. In their October meeting in Sacramento, there was very strong preference or a strong indication that changes in the law that could be made that would allow state engineers to use prima facie 25 mile per hour speed limits on state highways in business districts, whereas they cannot now, but local engineers can. So I'm asking that RTC monitor the bill and provide you with a formal update so that we can take a position as a commission to support more friendly ways to establish speed limits on local streets and state highways. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to address us in oral communications? Uh, okay, we'll go to is there, uh, number, item number three. Any additions or deletions uh, to the consent uh, or regular agendas? So there is a handout for items 14, 16, and 18. Should be on everybody's desk. Okay, uh, we'll move to the um, consent agenda. Um, items number four through nine. Is there are there any uh, any questions about the consent agenda? Anybody want to move the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Public moved by. Well, we need to hear whether okay. there's anybody from uh, the public. The, anybody from the public would like to address us on issues on the consent agenda? Okay, it was moved by Schifrin, seconded by Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, we will go to the uh, item number seven, the, uh, or excuse me, um, 
the budget and expense, there's no consent items there. Um, the, on the regular agenda, the commissioner reports. Any commissioners have any oral reports that they would like to give? Uh, Mr. Rotkin. I just want uh, people to know that the Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz County is holding a forum on the rail corridor on February 8th. That will be after our next meeting on the 6th, but I thought I would give people advance notice about it. We are going to have a presentation by uh, the RTC and Friends of the Rail Trail about um, planning in the corridor, where we are at in the progress of actually constructing both the bicycle and pedestrian path and where we are in the planning for the uh, mass transit piece of it. So that is just open to the public and uh, for people to get more information about what we are up to in that, on that corridor. Thank you. Where's the location? Oh, sorry. It's at the Police Community Room in Santa Cruz, um, which is uh, 155 Center Street uh, near Laurel, Center and Laurel, across from Loudon Nelson Community Center. And it's uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. The doors open at 930, but the program will begin at 10 o'clock on the um, 8th of February. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schiffer. I just wanted to make a clarification on the consent agenda. It, oh, yes. it included items 4 through 14, not oh, just I'm sorry, 4 I said 9, 9, didn't I? I'm sorry, I had the one page. Okay. You're right. Uh, that's items, uh, the consent agenda was item 4 through 14. Okay. Um, uh, Bruce, can I make a comment real quick on that? Sure. Hi, Brian Peoples, Executive Commute. Oh, uh, Michael, I want to correct you. It's not Friends of Rail Trail, it's Friends of Rail and Trail. Rail and trail, not friends of rail trail. Thank you for the correction. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments from oral reports from uh, commissioners? Uh, the director's report, Mr. Preston. Item number six. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, commissioners and uh, members of the public. Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner uh, Pearson, um, because of the mistake on the number, we have some public who would like to make a comment. Oh, okay. Move to reconsider that okay. item, just for the purpose of formality. Move to reconsider that item, and you can make a comment on the, so the, what the item, item on the. Which what item is it? When we find out. Item seven and eight. They, are, they were in the original motion. They were part of the original. I don't motion. care if, if a comment is made. I'm happy to. Well, if they are already part of the original motion, then I'll be just never mind. Just go ahead and make your comment. I'll leave it to the chair. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> On item seven, I appreciate the efforts of RTC staff to do these project initiation documents on Highway 9. Uh, but I do have a concern on the complete corridor study that there were a multitude of recommendations on Highway 9 corridor study that dealt with the adjoining streets that, that approached the highway. So I would like to see more progress with the RTC and County Public Works to program some improvements or some further actions on the adjoining streets. Um, secondly, we've waited far too long for basic operational and maintenance improvements on Highway 9. Caltrans continues to defer basic requests and refer them to this corridor study process. We're not getting good improvements or maintenance efforts particularly in the area of lane narrowing, ponding in the walkways, um, basic signal timing adjustments, ADA improvements. It's all being brushed under, under the, the guise of the corridor study. And um, that's all I have on item seven. On item eight, this um, five crosswalk improvements in San Lorenzo Valley on Highway 9. We received this grant in December of 2018. It's now 14 months later and there's been no action. It was originally uh, going to be designed by RTC. Then I was told the county. Now we're referring it back to Caltrans who issued the grant in the first place. Um, I think it's really sad that it takes 14 months to do basic uh, solar crosswalk flashers. Um, and secondly, these flashers only cost $6,000 for a pair of them. Their installation can be completed quickly. We have $250,000 that is now being referred to the shop program. And um, I think we can do far more than five crosswalks with a quarter million. So I want to make sure that we watch that budget closely and not just spend to the limit 
on five locations, but get as many locations uh, improved on Highway 9 as we can. Thank you. Okay. I didn't, uh, anybody else, uh, I don't think we missed anybody else on the oral communications or Are consent agenda? Numbers. Consent <laughs> agenda? Yeah, we got the numbers right. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on now to uh, the director's report, item number 16. Thank you, uh, Chair McPherson, commissioners and members of the public, and Happy New Year to you all. Um, looking forward to a great 2020. Uh, one of the things I've been working on is trying to uh, solidify my staffing. Um, I had several vacancies at the RTC. I'm pleased to announce today that um, Amanda Marino to fill the remaining vacancy transportation planner position. Amanda graduated with a bachelor's of science double major in planning, public policy, and management and environmental studies with a minor in earth science from the University of Oregon. Since her graduation, she has been working as a transportation coordinator at the Lane County Transit District in Eugene, Oregon, where she worked on congestion mitigation program to target neighborhoods to address barriers to choosing transportation options. Amanda has experience working with GIS and conducting environmental studies. We expect that Amanda will work well with various RTC committees as well as RTC's de traffic demand management program. Amanda is expected to start work on Monday, February 2nd. I'm also pleased to announce that RTC has appointed Jason Thompson into a permanent transportation planning technician position. Jason started working at RTC in June 2019 as a provisional transportation planning technician. Ja Jason graduated in 2016 from Cal Poly with a bachelor's of science degree in forestry and natural resource management. His experience working with utility companies and vegetation control has been very useful on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Jason has also gained experience working on the regional conservation investment study and, and traffic demand management. Jason will continue working on maintenance on the railway as well as assisting transportation planners in various assignments. Finally, I am pleased to announce that the RTC has appointed Fernanda Pini into a permanent transportation planning technician position. Fernanda commenced working at RTC in November 2017 as an administrative assistant three. Fernanda has a bachelor's of arts in philosophy from the University of Maryland. While working at RTC, Fernanda has attended classes at San Jose State University as a candidate for a master in public administration. In July 2019, I appointed Fernanda to a provisional transportation planning technician position and immediately assigned her to assist me with the preparation of the inaugural Measure D implementation plan, the draft of which was released last month, and that item is on today's agenda. Fernanda is expected to assist transportation planners in various functions with a focus on programming, contract management, and legislative issues. With Fernanda's appointment to the transportation planning technician position, RTC has an opening for an administrative assistant for which we are currently recruiting. I have um, a couple announcements on MBSST projects. Segment seven, phase one of the Coastal Rail Trail will be breaking, breaking ground soon. To celebrate this milestone, Ecology Action and Friends of the Rail and Trail will be hosting a groundbreaking celebration on January 25th from one to three at Santa Cruz Mountain Brewery. All members of the community are invited. And I said it correctly, although it's written incorrectly, uh, the, the, the name of Friends of Rail and Trail. The city of Watsonville opened construction bids on a portion of segment 18 between Ohlone Parkway and Watsonville Slough Trail on December 17, 2019. Staff is expected to make a recommendation on awarding a construction contract to the apparent low bidder at their next city council meeting on January 21st, 2020. And my understanding is that the bids did come in under the engineer's estimate and there is sufficient funds to award this contract. I have uh, a couple, uh, uh, sh a short update on Highway 1 projects. RTC staff continues to work on the delivery of the Highway 1 bus on shoulder auxiliary lane projects. These projects are consistent with the direction of the state towards multimodal highway projects as they include bicycle overcrossings and will promote transit use with bus on shoulders components. The projects have been very popular with the California Transportation Commission staff and are expected to compete well for the next cycle of Senate Bill 1, Solutions to Congested Corridor 
uh, program funding. Uh, last week, or actually this week on Monday, I was at the CalCOG meeting in Sacramento, and this project was brought up as an example of how um, a highway project can self-mitigate for um, the transportation impacts that they do have because of the transit elements, and that's what makes this project so popular with the California Transportation Commission because we are facing a climate emergency, and it is very important that we um, implement our projects in a way that consider mitigation for the traffic impacts with um, such elements as, as active transportation and um, transit with the bus on shoulders components. The first project from 41st Avenue to SoCal Avenue is in final design and will be ready for construction pending grant funds in 2021. Staff has started working on environmental clearance of the second project from State Park to Bay Porter and has interviewed and ranked for firms to perform environmental clearance for the third project from Freedom to State Park. Staff expects to provide a recommendation for a construction contract for the Freedom to State Park project as early as the February RTC meeting. Environmental clearance on these two projects will allow these two projects to also compete for SB1 funding, but those would be in the subsequent round in 2022. The TIG M trolley demonstration um, is going to be postponed. In December, the RTC approved a temporary license agreement with TIG M for demonstration of a passenger rail trolley vehicle. The demonstration was being planned to begin on February 14, 2020. TIG M has been working on approvals by the Federal Railroad Administration and the California Public Utilities Commission and has determined that it may not be able to secure approvals in time for a demonstration in February. Therefore, TIGM has notified RTC staff that it will need to postpone the demonstration to allow sufficient time to obtain all approvals and also to prepare a more comprehensive marketing plan as requested by the Commission at our December 2019 meeting. Due to the desire to ensure that there are no potential conflicts between Santa Cruz Big Trees and Pacific Railroad trains to the Santa Cruz Boardwalk, on the proposed trolley demonstration, the next window for a potential demonstration is October 2020. An October 2020 demonstration will give TIGAM and the RTC sufficient time to advertise and prepare for this event. Staff will keep the RTC informed and will return as appropriate with proposed revisions to the license and details for the trolley demonstration. We are proceeding with the track repairs. We did um, get approval for that. Um, we're just not rushing through trying to get them done in January. It looks like it may be February, pending weather as to when we'll get those repairs done. Um, next month, and this is not in my, my written uh, uh, um, report, but I wanted to let you know we are working on our legislative agenda. Um, something came up during public comment regarding the promiscuous speed limit, um, and I wanted to um, ensure you that that has been in our legislative agenda. It has just not been called out in terms of AB 2363 because the, length, the bill number keeps changing and we wanted to focus on the issue and not the bill number and get it messed up. So that was in our legislative agenda and we plan to continue to keep it in our legislative agenda and monitor the, the bill moving forward and make sure that, um, that the authors know that um, the, the, the bill has uh, the RTC's support. Um, there are, um, were various items regarding Highway 9 um, on today's consent account, uh, agenda, which were you just approved which has shown a very good working relationship with Caltrans in trying to get Highway 9 improvements done. Uh, there was a letter from Eileen Lowe, um, which she may um, address in her director's report. There have been some minor issues that I've been bringing up with Caltrans, such as the ponding issue on Highway 9. Um, I uh, addressed that issue as soon as it was brought to my attention, actually submitted a ticket uh, through the Caltrans system and then also reached out to Caltrans um, folks in San Luis Obispo. Um, they came up with a very quick design and informed me that they would complete that work within two months. I emailed them again last night um, because the two months has passed, but I do know that they plan on addressing that situation and that maybe Eileen has more information. That concludes my director's report. Thank you very much, and congratulations on filling the positions very much needed uh, for full time. Uh, any questions from the uh, uh, commissioners? 
Ms. Gomez. Uh, thank you. Uh, with the timing of the repairs of the tracks and the postponement for the demonstration, would it be feasible to see that there would be a demonstration available in Watsonville? The, the issue regarding the demonstration in, in Watsonville was never really an issue regarding timing. It was the, um, the issue about um, um, conflicts with um, progressive rail and the operations for freight down in that area. So I don't think that additional time would necessarily take those conflicts away. And, and can we do something to work with them to allow a demonstration if that's a, I mean, because for example, if they're going to be doing anything else besides just the freight, they're going to still have to figure out how to remedy different things that are on the tracks. Um, is this something that we can work up so that we can actually have the availability of having this demonstration in Watsonville as well? <coughs> I understand your interest in it, and I can certainly bring it up again with both uh, TIG M and Progressive Rail to see if there's any opportunities to um, provide a, a greater scope for the demonstration. And then I just have one last question that has to do with this new bill that's being um, put together. Can you send us or make sure that we have and we can update um, also our council that have this interest on the, the speed, the language of that particular bill and how it could impact or benefit the communities that would like to see something available to them for changes for their, their speed limits? Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? This is a non-action item. Any, any comments from the public? Okay, we will move to um, item number 17, the Caltans report, Ms. Mo. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy New Year, everyone. I'd like to first let you know that, the, that Caltans is still accepting comments on the California Freight Mobility Plan until the end of this month. Uh, this is an important document for the state uh, as freight is a, is a cornerstone to our economy. Uh, it's also important that we're protecting multimodal mobility, uh, protecting environmental stewardship, uh, protecting and, and enhancing healthy communities, protecting safety and resiliency for all Californians, and being uh, mindful and responsible stewards of our assets. Uh, this, uh, as I said, this plan is available for review until the end of the month, and the policies set forward are expected to help guide uh, future decisions on investments that will support freight uh, in accordance with those goals. Last week, Governor Newsom signed uh, Executive Order N-23-20 to fight homelessness throughout the state. He's, he's directed various state agencies to take on additional roles, and that includes Caltrans. We will be we will be working, or we are, the state is working on, a, on an action plan uh, for this, and Caltrans role is kind of two-part. It's in, uh, one is helping assist in the uh, leasing of property that's adjacent to highway facilities. So in some cases, this may include state right-of-way. Other times, it may be adjacent to state right-of-way, but we have expertise in terms of lease agreements and things like that. Uh, and then it will also involve uh, how we work with our local partners on uh, transitioning uh, for folks that um, into safer uh, shelter. So you will, uh, your member agencies should expect to to hear directly from Caltrans uh, in the in the coming weeks in terms of how we can uh, better work in partnership to address address this crisis. You have a project update in your, uh, the standard update that you have in your agenda packet there. And I would just like to uh, note that on project number 19, which is one of the, um, which is our pedestrian enhancement project uh, that there, I know there's great interest in, uh, mentions that we would go to construction in February, but it looks like that's going to be uh, April. Uh, and that is in due to the, um, additional locations that we've added. We're bringing in that Highway Safety Improvement Program funding that the RTC uh, provided to us. We're adding those five locations for Highway 9. It is impacting the schedule, but we expect uh, construction to get underway in April. Uh, and April should be, uh, so I'll just transition now into the Highway 9 update. Um, maybe I'll pause for a moment and ask you if there's any questions on the first, first bits. Sorry. The April date is in reference to the five pedestrian crossings that the member of the public talked about. The um, if you if you have the um, project update there, the little table. Uh, project 19 is a crosswalk and pedestrian safety enhancement um, project. 
it has, uh, it's dealing with four highways in Santa Cruz, but there are locations in Monterey County on Highway 68 and 183. It's an extensive, um, it's an extensive project. I don't have the total number of locations for the whole contract. It's under a million dollars. We are um, bringing in the, um, the Highway Safety Improvement Program funding to include the other five locations. So it's, um, it's an extensive, a number of locations, yes. Uh, question on the 152, since it's been on the books for such a long time, and now we've added Highway 9, is Highway 9 projects going to be prioritized over 152? I mean, I hope not. I mean, I know it's important Highway 9 and their crossing, but we, this is an important crossing for us, and, and we've been pushing for this for now going on two years. And, and so, I mean, we're looking out April to start construction. And so are, are we actually looking further out for the city of Watsonville now? Usually the contractor has discretion in terms of the order of work. We did make a request that the 152 location, and I believe there's another one in the city of Salinas, that are very high priority. We've made commitments um, in both locations. Uh, hopefully um, that priority is being passed along to the, the contractor as in terms of order of work. Um, that's what we, we did make that request be reflected in the uh, contract documents. Ms. Brown. Thanks for the report. Uh, with respect to the governor's executive order, you mentioned that Caltrans would be working <laughs> on a plan and that would include uh, potential lease agreements with local jurisdictions. I'm wondering if that um, also includes uh, potential land transfers. I know there were, that it's listed in the, the executive order that that was a possibility, um, transfers between jurisdictions. So is that part of the consideration as well? And then secondly, what is the timing? As f I know this is new. So as far as you know, what kind of timeline are you expecting at Caltrans to move through this process? Uh, I'll take the second question first. The, the draft action plan is just being formulated, so I can't really be very specific. Of course, it's it's been given top priority, so there's an urgency to this. Uh, it's the best I can say on that. We have uh, had conversations, for example, with the city of Santa Cruz already prior to the executive order uh, for some housing uh, and some interest in some property at the near the Highway 19 inter yeah. intersection. I think that will be proceeding. I can't give a time frame, but um, those are the kinds of things that we'll, we'll be working uh, all the jurisdictions on. Thank you. Mr. Caput. Uh, thank you. And uh, on item 18, <coughs> that's Highway 152, Wait. Corlitas Creek, uh, east of Beverly to Houlihan and College Road. Uh, is it, if the money was there, if the money comes in, you know, for the completion of this, the earliest that the project could take place uh, is uh, spring of 2022, or if the money... It, because at one time the money was a problem, uh, but if the money came in, uh, that could be actually started earlier, or is it's part of that plan being that they have to look at it and they have to come up with a, uh, you know, a, a, a schematic to, in order to start it. Um. Commissioner Caput, the uh, project number 18 is fully programmed in the shop. The, it, it's the, in the uh, project approval environmental document phase currently, and it's anticipated for construction in 2022, the spring, as you, as you pointed out. That's our best estimate. There is no funding gap that we know of at this time. Right, and uh, how's, the, how's the money looking as far as the, this project? It's programmed, so it's committed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Okay, then I'll go yeah, on to the Highway 9 ahead. portion. Yeah, okay, ahead. all right. Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll address first the maintenance issue that has come, had has come up in a couple of uh, conversations already, the ponding there um, near Graham. It's on Highway 9 you're talking Gra about. Highway yeah. 9 in Graham Hill Road. There was a concern about some ponding. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there's some drainage work that's also been incorporated into another contract that has multiple locations. The first location was was on Highway 17, uh, and we've made a request that this um, this particular ponding location be addressed next, and so it's scheduled to occur to be go into construction next week. 
Uh, and then in your packet also is a, a letter uh, that your executive director alluded to, uh, dated uh, January 7th, and we gave a, uh, a fairly comprehensive evaluation of the project initiation uh, type activities on Highway 9 that are underway. I want to thank you for your approval of the cooperative agreement for the Complete Streets PID, the, the big one that we've been talking about, uh, that that will take on the uh, all the recommendations that were identified in the corridor study and evaluate uh, what are the scope um, and schedule of improvements that could come out of that uh, for and timing of that. Uh, the As you see, there are several uh, projects and the, the diagram in the back kind of helps schematically show uh, what's what. So the, the, um, the cooperative agreement you just approved is for that corridor wide PID. Then we have uh, several Caltrans uh, other shop projects also being scoped. Uh, one of them is a, a striping job and that is basically to widen out the stripe from four inches to six inches. You're probably familiar with seeing that in other parts, parts of the state because especially in the nighttime or rainy days, the striping is much more prominent and you, you feel much more confident driving around uh, with brighter stripe. So that's what the striping job will entail. Uh, the other two uh, in the black there are referred to as the pavement uh, PIDs uh, for pavement preservation at the lower end and the higher end of the corridor, respectively. Those um, will be kicking off soon. Uh, and then uh, the third one and the one of maybe greatest interest is that uh, near Felton Graham Hill area, the shop safety PID. We expect to have that completed in April. We're looking at the, um, what type of improvements we can make uh, for uh, pe pedestrian safety specifically for walking and bicycling. And so that one, uh, I think we're gonna, we'll be wrapping up in a few months, and um, uh, and in the same time frame as what we mentioned for the pedestrian enhancements project, the construction will also start in <coughs> April of 2020. I don't know what the timing location will be for construction of Highway 9, but that contract will begin in April. All right, any questions on Highway 9? I just wanted to comment. Uh, this Highway 9, we've been discussing this for a long time. Uh, I have found uh, Caltrans to be cooperative in trying to work this out as quickly as we can. Uh, it's, it's a special situation when you have your main street as a state highway in your community in the mountains. Uh, this is going to be of a tremendous benefit to the people of San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, and I really appreciate it it's because it's in my district, but also just the persistence and uh, following through with what you were going to say you were going to do. And uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, I appreciate all the work that's being done in this county, and it's very impressive when we're driving through. Um, just to maybe share a note with your counterparts in Santa Clara County, uh, it would be helpful if they knew or had comments from this county of work that they need to do on their side of the 17 and the striping. Uh, I've gone over 8 o'clock at night, you know, in the weather, and the striping, it's very difficult. So if they hear from us that our commuters that are going over that hill for the safety on that side, um, some of those items could be brought to their attention for working through, you know, uh, our, with our partners in our in the community because it, it's been, I, I think it's pretty dangerous when we, we, it's very impressive of what we're doing on our end. And we also need to see that South um, Santa Clara County does their part also to make sure that our commuters are safe. And I do happen to know, I'm glad you brought that up, Commissioner um, Gomez, as in District 4, they have uh, recently undergone an evaluation of uh, certain improvements that they can make in a short term. And I'll be sure to follow up with that information because I know that they've got stuff um, in the hopper, uh, as it were. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, questions from the public? Morning, commissioners. Chair, um, just wanted to go back a few months um, and ask Caltrans if there's any update on the Grant 5310 program, which is basically uh, exchanging diesel um, paratransit vehicles for electric. And um, just trying to get a, an idea of what the difference in price would be here. Um, there's options and things available out there, especially through MBARD, because they are going to be offering incentive programs for paratransit in their incentive program. So 
just keeping the trying to stay on top of this. <laughs> Regretfully, I don't have an answer for you today. Uh, I elevated the asking the question to to get more clarification, but I'm it's still top of mind. So. Okay. Uh, is there anyone that I can personally just talk to instead of constantly coming up here and uh, putting in time here? I could maybe just communicate back and forth if they get get an answer. On the I'm just concerned mainly with the cost difference because I was going to use uh, my visits to Monterey Bay Community Power, which I attend consistently, uh, to possibly grant this difference between what funding you have versus what it takes to get the electric vehicle. So I just, just need a number, basically. I'm in communication with the Deputy Director of Planning and Modal Pro Programs at Caltrans. Um, hopefully hear back by the end of the week. and. Um, I mean, I could certainly share contact information with you. Okay, and I, I'll give you a card afterwards. That'd be good. All right, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, thank you again. We will move to item number 18. Uh, let's see, it is, is it, well, do we have to? Yeah, I should do, wait. We have to wait for 10 minutes. We'll, we'll go down to um, item number 19, uh, City of Pub Santa Cruz Public Works Department report. Thank you for being here, and we're going to put you ahead of schedule. So how's that? That's great, thank you. Uh, no. Chair, commissioners, Chris Schneider, assistant director, city of Santa Cruz. Um, so I have a brief PowerPoint to uh, explain the status of where we are with uh, several projects that are funded through the Regional Transportation Commission and with local funds. The projects are State Highway 1 and 9 intersection improvements, river and water street pavement rehabilitation, the Sanctuary Scenic Trails within the city and partially into the county, and then also Pacific Avenue sidewalk in the beach area. So uh, where are we with one and nine? Uh, currently, the environmental review and design are complete. We've been working closely with Caltrans to finish up the process. We're in the acquisition uh, right now and applying for permits. Uh, construction is estimated at 7.7 .7 million, and it's a combination of STIP, RSTP, exchange, and local funding. Uh, we've already spent local funding on the design and the right-of-way acquisition. We've also, um, as Eileen told you, we're, we've met with Caltrans on acquisition of additional Caltrans right-of-way for a, a mixed-use project in the future. Um, we are required to award a construction contract by July, so we're under the gun to get this project really happening. If we award in July, then you know likely construction would start in the fall of 2020. Next slide, please. Um, River and Water Streets, partially uh, funded by RSTP Exchange. We've awarded a contract to um, uh, MCM as well as uh, Villalobos uh, construction for the handicap ramps, and that project um, will be starting in March with the access ramp replacements. And so that's River Street from Water Street to Potrero, which is just short of the 1-9 intersection, so that we're not overlapping with that project and having to tear out things that were just constructed. And then also Water Street from Ocean to Brantz of Forty. Um, next slide. Um, so on the rail trail projects, uh, my apologies for this bottom part, not reading too well. Um, so the Trestle Trail project, obviously, you know, is complete. It's been a very successful project. It's an award-winning project. So we've currently won three awards for it. We're in the running for another one. So anyway, we'll present that information at a later date. Uh, segment seven, phase one, has been awarded to Granite Rock Construction, and that project starts on Tuesday weather permitting. Um, but anyway, it's been a, a long haul, um, but we've resolved all the final uh, cleanup, uh, contaminated soil issues, et cetera. We work closely with Granite Rock on that and the County Environmental Health, and the project's really ready to go. It runs through um, approximately the end of the summer. Uh, construction award was 6.2 million, and so it's 4.1 million of state and federal funding, including the earmark. Uh, 1.1 million RTC Measure D and 1 million of the city Measure D. There have been other funding parts for the design, the permitting, et cetera, including funds from um, our local supporters like Ford. Segment seven, uh, phase two, uh, we've just applied for a construction grant through uh, Prop 68, 
And so uh, we've had a visit from CTC staff and uh, that visit went well. So we're optimistic that we will um, have a project to, or we'll be funding a project in the near future. Segments eight and nine, which is from Beach Street and the beach area out to 17th. This is a joint project with the County of Santa Cruz and uh, we have funding for environmental review and design and that project or hiring the consultants to start that work will be happening this spring. Uh, we've already been coordinating with RTC staff and uh, the county on the project. We're getting ready to submit um, the preliminary information to Caltrans to start the process. Um, that's it on this on this slide and then Pacific Avenue which is the most recently funded project and if you look on that slide to the right you'll see people walking in the street and that's been happening uh, for a very long time anyway we're intending to build a sidewalk there improve the drainage and extend the bike lane and that project's currently under design it's funded with RSTP exchange and city measure D funds and we hope to be out to bid um, uh, this summer and award a contract in the fall after the tourist season's over or mostly over. And that uh, concludes my uh, brief presentation. If you have any questions, you know, these are not all the pro transportation projects we're working on. These are solely the ones that come through the RTC. We have about $2 million worth of grant funding for active transportation. Uh, one contract's been awarded for a million to do all kinds of crossing improvements, pedestrian crossing improvements. Um, we're doing a variety of other projects. Very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Schifrin. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very helpful report. The Highway 1, Highway 9 project, I thought I heard you mention that it needed a permit. Um, who needs to give a permit to that project? Um, U.S. and State Fish and Wildlife, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, which we have that permit now, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. We'll see an environmental regulatory agency. Yes, that. yes. And are they, I assume, are aware of the, the city's deadline in terms of starting construction. Yes. They tend to wait till the last minute, if I remember. Thank you. Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it, there's some great work going on there, and congratulations on the, uh, on the awards for uh, the first part of, uh, of the trail. Very excited to know that we're going to start construction on the on the next segment there. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in segment nine, uh, this joint project with the county. Uh, you talked about hiring a consultant uh, in the spring, and when do you think the design work? Well, how long do you think that will that that will take? Um, I, I think it will take at least a year. Um, complicated project. Um, you know, there's water crossings that are involved, et cetera. So about a year. Po pro possibly longer. Environmental first year and then design usually typically starts about halfway through that process because we'll need to know some of the details. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the city taking on this joint project and I think it'll be a huge benefit. Segment nine was one of the highest rated segments of, of need uh, when we did the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail report. So I'm really excited about that one being. Yeah. And we want to thank the land trust because they are providing the local match of 1.5 million. So it's a, a huge uh, benefit. I'm not sure we'd be this far if we didn't have that contribution. You're here. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Gomez. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a very impressive. We come to Santa Cruz, so we don't always hear what the projects are until we have this RTC meeting. Uh, and that particular project of the 9-1, um, you're over a bridge. Uh, can you give us a little idea on how the impact of traffic, is there a diversion of traffic, is there going to be closure, is the partial open? Just so we have some idea of what else, it, when it comes to construction, we're going to be looking at for, you know, traffic delays? Right. So we're working, um, you know, as it's a state highway intersection, so we're closely with Caltrans. A lot of the work's going to have to take place at night to minimize impacts to the traveling public. and. Um, we don't yet have all the staging plans, so I don't. I can't report to you exactly what's going to be closed. There will be some lane closures, but again, most of that's going to occur at night, so have minimal impact on the public. Okay, thank you. I'll show you the rest. Any other questions? Any uh, questions from the public? Okay, now the uh, hour of ten o'clock. 
Um, I've got five minutes if you want. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at my watch. Okay, I, I'm looking well, at that one. Okay. Watch. So, I have a comment. Oh, on the, 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 the last give item? Five minutes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> you got to give you a little time there. Brian Peebles, executive. Well, I think you had left so, uh, I got, just got a text from my wife, who's a kindergarten teacher at Valencia Elementary. And it's really funny. She sent me the text, and there's a book that they're teaching the kids to read. And it says that um, today the cars we're riding will have a driver but in the future, they will have no driver. So I found that really interesting that in kindergarten, I guess they're kind of giving them a heads up that they're probably never going to get their driver's license. <laughs> okay. So anyways, right, maybe kill you, you some time. Save me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think we'll just wait for three minutes to be. Yeah, just take a three minute break. Okay, I'll reconvene the uh, meeting of the Regional Transportation Com uh, Commission. Hour of 10 o'clock, we'll have a public hearing on the draft 2020 Measure D strategic uh, impl implementation plan. Uh, Mr. Preston. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair McPherson, and um, thanks to the Commission for um, moving the Measure D um, ordinance to the ballot um, in 2016. Um, thank you also to uh, the public for approving Measure D with two thirds of the vote. Um, um, as part of the uh, Measure D ordinance, um, the RTC was made um, the Measure D authority. And um, as part of the ordinance, um, the RTC is um, required to allocate, administer, and oversee the expenditure of all measure revenue which are not directly allocated by formula annually to other jurisdictions through an implementation plan which it will update at least every five years following a public hearing. Uh, today's item is um, to have that public hearing and um, to um, also receive public comment and uh, uh, see how we want to move forward with the plan. Approximately 53% of the expenditure plan is not directly allocated by formula to other entities, um, which include the following regional projects and programs. It's the entire highway corridor, the uh, San Lorenzo Valley Highway 9 corridor, which is part of the um, neighborhood uh, investment category, the Highway 17 wildlife crossing, which is also part of the neighborhood uh, investment category, um, the entire active transportation or coastal rail trail investment category, and um, the rail corridor. As stated in the ordinance, the purposes of the implementation plan are to define the scope, cost, and delivery schedule of each regional project or program, detail revenue projections, and possible financing tools needed to deliver the expenditure plan within 30 years promised to the voters, and describe the risks, critical issues, and opportunities that the authority should address to expeditiously deliver the expenditure plan. Each year, the um, um, regional projects come forward with an annual report, which um, consists also of a five-year plan of projects. Um, that has been done three times already. So the, expenditure, the um, Measure D inaugural implementation plan feeds off of those three already approved, uh, those uh, years worth of um, five-year plans to build what is the short-term vision of Measure D. It also um, looks at a longer-term 30-year forecast. Um, we um, produced the first 30-year uh, uh, cash flow model, basically taking those five-year plans and putting them into the model and seeing how we are doing fiscally as we move forward. Um, a central theme of the Measure D um, 
um, inaugural implementation plan is leveraging. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, Chris Snyder got to go in front of me today because we saw several of their projects and we saw really what uh, it takes to get a transportation project delivered, and that is multiple fund sources. The uh, Measure D ordinance itself was very much um, um, uh, um, put together with the concept of leveraging, that we should look for uh, other fund sources and try to use Measure D in a strate strategic way to leverage additional funds and maximize the amount of improvements that can be delivered to the community. Um, the cash flow model is shown in the uh, Measure D expenditure plan in Chapter 5. You'll see that all of the ending balances are positive. Um, we looked at each program individually, and we also looked collectively as to what it would take to make sure that each program can live um, within its own means. Um, one of the things that we did notice is um, there will there is an instance with a project, and that's the Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing, where um, there's an opportunity to get that project delivered within the next several years. But that project will not have all of its funding um, um, that is expected over 30 years, which is $5 million um, in um, the year that it would go to construction. So that particular project, um, we looked at whether or not an inner program loan could be um, administered between the highway program, which has additional, uh, additional capacity at this time, and the Highway 17 project, and we found that it could. So um, we also put together a series of policies, which are shown in Chapter 4 of the Strategic Implementation Plan. Uh, we discussed longer-term financing, and we actually did take a look at whether or not it would be appropriate to try to bring additional money to the table now. And we found that um, we really have enough funding in the early years. The early years of a sales tax measure, you're accumulating money, you're developing your projects, um, you're going through the um, non-capital expenditure side where you're uh, doing environmental documents, you're doing um, uh, initial design. The big expenditures haven't come yet. We also found that um, uh, you know something pretty substantial had happened since uh, Measure D passed, and that was um, SB1 was passed by uh, the state Senate, which brought significant transportation funding and opportunities to leverage Measure D. So um, we we considered that, and we considered um, what the requirements to apply for those grants would be, and in many cases, it is that you have environmental clearance. So um, the more environmental documents that we have, the more projects that we can apply for state funding grants are. So this, um, you know, putting together the policies, we very much put together um, uh, programming methodology based on, you know, what is going to help us leverage the most additional funds, um, using Measure D in a way that we can provide environmental clearance and leverage funds as quickly as possible. Um, Bringing back the um, the discussion on um, this plan really focusing on the first five years, um, this plan is not expected to, to um, show every last improvement that's going to be delivered over the 30 years. We're focusing more on the short term because it doesn't make particular sense to try to figure out how you're going to spend your money in year 27. So. Um, we show the first five years. We also show significant programming capacity beyond what we're showing in this initial plan. If you look at the cash flow model and you look at the last year, you'll see $407 million will be available for future programming of regional investments. Each year, we will come back with a new five-year plan and program one additional year, and we will ultimately come back at least every five years to update the strategic plan. We can amend the strategic plan at any time. It is a planning level document. It does not require sequel clearance. The draft SIP therefore only includes fact sheets in chapter six for projects and program investments that are included in Measure D five-year regional plans or proposed in the Measure D five-year uh, regional plans. 
most of these items have been brought forward to you before and approved for you before for programming purposes. The only exception is the Freedom to State Park Highway 1 Auxiliary Lane Bus on Shoulder project that was discussed at the last RTC meeting and this commission directed me to move forward with a request for proposals which I have done. Um, that is the only amended five-year plan and that is a, um, a um, replacement page um, of uh, several replacement pages that were provided as an attachment to this staff report to show clearly that this would um, be an amendment to that five-year programming plan. All the other ones have already been, uh, all the other actions and programming has already taken place by this commission. There, um, with that, um, this, this plan was released to the public on Friday, December 20th. Uh, uh, I recommend that we move forward with a public hearing on this plan so we can receive public ha comment and that I also recommend that this board consider this uh, public comment and provide me with any directions as to whether or not you would like to see any amendments to this plan. We have received several comments from the public. This plan went out to thousands of uh, uh, interested parties through our email efforts. It also was published in the newspapers. We've received comments supporting various projects. Um, we received comments that uh, other projects that you've already approved programming for should not have been funded. Um, we did receive one comment regarding the uh, Freedom to State Park Auxiliary Bus Lane project that um, it's not included in the expenditure plan and that the, this plan should be amended to be able to move forward w with, uh, with uh, funding for that plan. Um, for that project. Uh, we are taking that um, very seriously and under consideration and um, if we decide um, um, that we should take any additional action, we can come back on in February 6th and take that, that action. Um, there is a provision in the ordinance itself to allow for um, an amendment to the expenditure plan, but we have not determined whether one is necessary or prudent at this time. Um, with that, I recommend that we um, that you open uh, the public hearing, receive public comment, and provide me with future uh, additional direction in terms of finalizing the inaugural Measure D strategic implementation plan. Thank you. Mr. Preston, uh, Mr. Johnson. Are you entertaining questions right now? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. i open it you. to the board and then go to the public. All right. Thank you for that report. Th uh, also, thank you for the, uh, which I thought was a, a very good draft, our uh, 2020 strategic implementation plan. You and your staff did. I thought it was very comprehensive and um, enlightening. And so talk a little bit about issuing pay-as-you-go versus bonding. I mean, what goes into that calcul calculus in terms of of uh, why you might want one versus the other? So um, right now we're moving forward with primarily a pay-as-you-go um, philosophy, the one exception being the inter-program loan, but that's still pay, you know, pretty much pay-as-you-go because it's internal within the programs itself. Um, bonding, you know, with, with bonding, you have to pay debt service. Um, debt service obviously takes away buying capacity for your projects, but it also could potentially allow your projects to move forward quickly. If you um, wait 30 years to acquire enough money to build a project, um, you could put yourself in a situation where the project cost inflates faster than the sales tax um, money um, receives additional growth based on both inflation, um, things cost more, and um, uh, real growth, which would be there's more citizens in, in Santa Cruz, so they're buying more goods. So you have to balance those you know, two things and, and, and in your consideration as to whether you want to bond. The wild card in all of this is the grants and the grant opportunities. And um, when we apply for SB1 funding, um, they look on at um, not only the, the value of your project, but um, how much local support that project is, is bringing to the table too. So um, if we 
bring zero dollars in Measure D and ask for a $50 million grant, um, we could get funded or they could say, well, we really think you should put some money in this project. They could say, we think we, you know, and, and it's real hard to get exact numbers of how much you should put. If you should put um, 5%, 10%, 20%, a half, um, or all of the money. Um, so if you could bond off of the sales tax measure and bring the money forward early, and it allows you to put, let's say, um, 10 million for a $50 million project, and you get a $40 million grant, then you consider that interest that you're paying back as, well, I got $40 million for a $10 million investment. I'm paying $3 million in interest. I saved this much in escalated cost. That interest could be well worth it in terms of uh, leveraging additional grant opportunities. <laughs> What we looked at right now was I don't see a need to finance for at least another two years. And so I've kind of, and I mentioned this in my staff report, I see us tr coming with an update to the strategic plan and that kind of corresponds with the next cycle of grant funding so we can make that decision at that time. Does it make sense to issue bonds so we have money to help leverage additional grant funds to move the projects forward sooner. And that would essentially be the decision that would be made in a couple years. So I guess what I'm hearing is that you have to be nimble and be able to adapt as uh, things move forward and um, take advantage of leveraging, you know, outside funds. And if you, if you need to bond or get money, then you would do so. You know, you were nice enough to thank the people who voted for this project um, or I guess Measure D in 2016 um, for the voters, but you might, might also consider thanking them for their patience because I think when, you know, I think tactically and with um, what people see is an important component politically and otherwise to see that progress is happening. And I'm not really sure that people have seen much progress, uh, at least on the outside. I know internally studies, um, EIRs and, and so forth, but, um, and that kind of leads me to my, to my next question. It's a little bit difficult to kind of estimate just how much all these, and you know, in this draft or in this um, allocation, there's a lot of projects and I see some pretty big numbers. So from a thousand feet, what is it, the total bill for all the projects that are listed in here? And what are the, what are the opportunities uh, and chances of us uh, getting enough money to pay for them? I know that there's a wild card with, you mentioned grants and outside funding and so forth, but uh, it seems like there's a lot of projects with huge costs. What are we gonna do? There are a lot of projects with, uh, with, with some huge costs and it's, um, it's hard to put an exact number on what we could, buy with Measure D. Um, Measure D itself is going to bring in, we projected in this implementation plan, over $760 million. You know, if we leverage that and get three to one, four to one, five to one, we could be looking at several billion dollars worth of improvements um, being delivered to the community um, over the 30-year time period. Um, with respect to um, you know, you haven't seen a lot of progress yet. Um, that's understandable, and I, and I understand the voters' patience um, um, can wear thin really quickly. And, I, and some of the comments that I received, too, were, how come I'm not seeing more things on the street yet? Um, we had that same debate um, in Sonoma County when their sales tax measure passed. Um, and it really goes to something I said earlier in, in that um, it takes... Um, several years to get a project construction ready, and that's when those big billion dollar price tags start to come in. So if you look at the cash flow model that, that was shown in chapter five of the ordinance, and you look at the ending cash balances, you'll see that we're spending a lot of money on planning studies, and then you'll see that money starts to accumulate later. The key is that in three, four, five years, we start to deliver those capital projects, and then you'll start seeing the money go down um, 
So um, we started showing, not in the first plan because there wasn't enough data on it, but the same issue came up and they asked me to include ending cash balances to show you know, where we're at because you know, everybody kind of came out of the woods saying, you know, we, we've, we have all these projects we want to deliver um, and then we were accumulating money. Our, our goal is not to accumulate money in these accounts, it's to spend them and deliver projects. And so I'm very focused on trying to put them in the best position, but it is going to take a little bit of patience in the early years to try to get these projects construction ready and then to accumulate enough money to match grants or then, you know, going back to your prior you know, question, possibly using financing tools to advance them even quicker. Can I ask one last question? Okay. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> don't want to hog Speaking all this patience. stuff. Yes, yeah, see you in patience. Um, so, you mentioned leveraging and three, four, five to one. With your experience in Sonoma, and that, that's one of, the, I think, the great reasons why you're, you're in the position that you are because of your experience, um, are those real? I mean, being able to access those things are, as a self help county? As a self help county in Sonoma, we leveraged at a ratio of five to one. Really? Five, f on the highway program, yeah. See, that was a quick question. That was, that was great. I, I like that. And, great you know, that, that, <laughs> that was in my presentation when I applied for this job. Okay, too. good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I'm, uh, you know, it really depends on, we're so dependent, then that shows it uh, for the matching funds, uh, the fast, what, what's the federal government going to do? Uh, what's the state going to do? Uh, they've already done what they're going to do, probably with SB1. But the FAST Act, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's it's up in the air of exactly what the that's going to be. So, how much we how much is available is still very much up in the air. But I, I will say, uh, and thanks. Uh, this is maybe a little <laughs> off the subject, but we just found out that they, there's a time extension for our storm storm damage projects that's going to really help the county and the cities. Uh, and uh, we're very appreciative of the state of California for um, or the state representatives getting that through the the federal government Congress. Uh, Ms. Lind. And one of the things I, I saw the outreach with um, various resources, social media, hard, you know, paper copies, press and things like that. But I'm wondering about <coughs> signage too to your major D funds at work or some of those on some of those projects might help also for people that not not really aware of where those funds are coming. So if sometimes that can help with the patients and, you know, maybe have that support with their next acts, acts that may come up. So We have in all of our cooperative uh, agreements with local jurisdictions that receive Measure D funds a requirement that they provide signage that Measure D funds are being used. And we are going to continue to make sure that the public is aware when Measure D funds are being used on uh, transportation improvements that um, this is where they came from and um, this is why you're seeing the improvements getting um, actually delivered. Uh, Mr. Leopold. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you uh, for putting together this plan. I think it makes sense uh, to look at a five-year plan, especially as we really uh, pivot from being simply a planning agency to a project delivery uh, agency. And um, to me, I see Measure D already at work. Uh, all of our jurisdictions have gotten uh, money out on road projects. Uh, I see the buses go by that have Measure D uh, stickers on it, and I see the lift line vans uh, go by with Measure D. So uh, we, these big projects, projects that, the, that the, uh, the Transportation Commission is responsible for, that's a new thing for us to have really big projects to get, get it done. I like the way this, um, the, the detail of information in here, um, this, the strategy of leveraging the funds, um, and using your experience in another county uh, to, to, to have some faith that some of this might work. I was also um, interested in uh, the fact that our unified corridor study, uh, it can be used as a document for, to allow us to access uh, some of the state congestion money because that seems to be a key part of the strategy. So. Um, uh, we, we could all debate, uh, or there has been some debate as to the merit of what we uh, came to, but the fact that we have a document that's now ready for us to <coughs> leverage more money means that the money we spent there is going to leverage tens of millions of dollars on the highway, on the rail corridor, and other projects. Um, I think it's also, um, uh, it's 
along that same lines, uh, thinking about those uh, state congestion corridor, congested corridors money is linking up uh, the highway and the and the the trail, the rail trail, um, together as as a way of um, moving projects along. That 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 we have this innovation already on the highway with the bus on shoulder, which I think, uh, as you mentioned, makes us com very competitive. Using the uh, the rail trail as uh, as another way to show that we're trying to create safety uh, and uh, no another mode of transportation on our you know on our main corridor that runs <coughs> parallel to uh, the highway uh, makes some sense and will help us get these projects done. It's no surprise to me that projects are more expensive than they were in 2012. We see that at the county, um, the uh, projects that we that uh, uh, five, seven years ago were um, uh, uh, cost something and now cost 40% more. It isn't because the, 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 the county is doing a bad job bidding. It's because there's a lot of people out there with resources. Um, uh, the cost of materials have gone up and the competition for contractors has, has increased. So uh, we're going to see price escalation over time, and I think that this plan that you have uh, will also help us be able to to, to uh, assimilate those uh, those increases, especially if we can leverage grant dollars. Uh, I also like the borrowing from ourselves. Um, it's a lot less complicated than borrowing from somebody else, uh, and probably a lot less expensive. Um, and it makes sense to, to that uh, one hand is helping the other hand, but no, no project would ever be short because of it. So uh, I, I appreciate the effort that went into this. Um, I think that uh, the we're going to find over time as we have to do the environmental permitting uh, for any of these projects that there will be additional costs. Um, I think that your experience in having done this in Sonoma County tells me that you're aware of, of those things that are not uh, obvious to m maybe someone like me or other members of the uh, commission. But I think by, uh, by using this strategy, updating it regularly, um, we'll be able to see pretty quickly whether we're on the right path or not. I mean, we have, there's a, there's a, there will be a cycle coming up uh, within the next uh, year to 18 months that we'll be able to see whether this strategy is, is, is something that's going to yield the kind of results. So I look forward to that, and I look forward to the continued updates of these strategic plans. <coughs> Mr. Bertrand. Um, oh, okay, it's working. Um, I appreciate your strategic, plan, uh, strategic approach to financing. I really do. And to echo um, John's comment, uh, the fact that this is going to be a living document and that you're going to be updating and responding to conditions as they occur um, in time in the future, I think is excellent. Um, but I also like to um, congratulate you in one sense uh, for responding to public input on concern for um, extra lanes after State Park Drive, and I appreciate uh, you doing that. It's not often the case that you're willing to say in pub people are willing to say in public that this is a viable issue that needs to be addressed. So I look forward to your presentation in two weeks. Thanks. Questions here? Any questions? Just make a quick call. Ms. Gomez. I, I think also we're, we're ahead of the curve with the strategic plan because I don't think all agencies are, are forward thinking that far on how to leverage and how to have something that's an elevator pitch when it comes to showing where, what we're ready to do to ask for the funds and, and doing the leverage. And I think that that's a very, very good, solid approach, especially when we're dealing with federal and getting getting the connections made and saying we've got a plan and here here it is. And and again, in, in a few minutes' time, o overall, I mean, it's a comprehensive plan, but to have it summarized to this level that it's um, easy to take to legislators and easy to take to the funding sources and easy to show that it's or it's it's simplifies. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's a more of a simplification approach of saying we're ready to go. Um, let us know when you can cut the check on these projects. Um, I, I think that shows that there's a lot more motivation and we're ready ready on that when we, we place those asks for that leverage. Uh, and I don't think that that's always an approach that other agencies take. Some of them are just way out there and, and not so prepared and, and having the control and, and the vision. And I think that that's very beneficial for this community to have this plan out there to use as an elevator pitch and flip it open and say, we're ready for this if you can go ahead and fund that. And 
because we already have the delays I and mean, we know that the environmental part of it, we're doing all of the homework for that so that that doesn't hang things up when we go and place those asks. So I, I, I'm very impressed um, with this strategic plan and it's an evolution and I, I just think that that will really help us in the long run when we're leveraging. We're, we're going to always have a wish list of projects and we're never going to have everything satisfied completely down because there's always going to be that evolution of the next project that we need to have that we didn't know we needed. Any other questions from the board at this point? Okay, I'll open up to for public comment on the strategic plan. Anybody would like to speak to us? Okay. Hopeful there. <laughs> Everybody's still waking up. Happy New Year, everyone. I'm Ray Cancino, CEO of Community Bridges. All right. So just wanted to thank everybody, especially the staff, uh, for helping us uh, kind of move through this uh, first five years and uh, everything that this uh, Measure D has allowed us to do. In this last year, we were able to basically leverage Measure D to bring in additional dollars, close to a half a million dollars uh, through CARB. Uh, and implemented the first uh, fleet of two vehicles of electric, all electric vehicles transporting seniors across our community. Um, it's an incredible opportunity to do so. Uh, we've now been in our new location, a uh, public facility um, that is also uh, supported by Measure D up in Watsonville. Uh, and for the first time ever, we have a permanent location uh, for our transportation services. And we're currently waiting uh, for the city of Watsonville to help us out uh, to complete our, our full plan of our planning and drainage. And so once that goes in, we'll have full operations by the end of the year. Uh, these dollars have been tremendous in the ability to basically uh, sustain uh, and also grow our um, transportation transportation service here in our community, and we're just so happy to have the resources and the ability to do that. Um, that's also the reason why we, in our first uh, five-year plan, we've really concentrated on facilities and construction because the cost of construction keeps escalating and growing. Um, we were able to find uh, a project that was actually less than our original uh, thought of what it would cost us, and that was just a lucky chance of us uh, coordinating with a, a, a landowner that understood the value of community and under, understood uh, what this would mean for our community. So thank you uh, to the owner that sold us that property. Um, I just wanted to share that we're continuously growing. Uh, we're seeing growth in our transportation services, and we're continuously trying to let our community know that the service is available. So um, this is one of those opportunities to remind everyone that um, Lift Line is available for everyone, uh, and you can apply online at uh, communitybridges.org. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to provide free medical services for those in needs in our community, maintaining their place of independence and safety in our community and providing door-to-door um, uh, -door service to those most in need. So thank you, and thanks for all your help. Thank you for your services. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Rick Longinati with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And first I wanna thank the staff for uh, reopening a consideration of the next batch of auxiliary lanes south of State Park Drive that uh, are not in the Measure D expenditure plan. I, th I think it's really important to voters to, uh, you know, encourage trust that bodies are not going to spend money on things that weren't in the expenditure plan. And $100 million is not a, a small amount of money, so sneaking that in and pretending it's part of the, uh, the voter mandate just wouldn't have integrity. So thank you for that. It, it extends you know, to the next time that voters vote on something. If they lose trust in government, they're, they're more likely to vote no. Um, and I passed out a, a sheet, and I hope it got all the way around. Um, the, uh, on the one side, it says what the Highway 1 alternative says about the TSM alternative. And the TSM is a combination of auxiliary lanes from Santa Cruz all the way down to Freedom Boulevard, plus ramp metering and some other things. And I don't know that everybody's really noticed this. So, the Caltrans report said there would be insignificant congestion relief, and you can read the details there. There'd be no improvement in, in the rate of accidents on account of these auxiliary lanes, and even the report that you have before you today says in, incorrectly that auxiliary lanes are, are gonna improve safety on the highway, but that's not what Caltrans found. Uh, and it would increase greenhouse gas emissions. So we have more cars on the highway, 25% increase. So for your 25% increase in greenhouse gas emissions, you get insignificant congestion relief. And so that's why I wanna encourage you to just reevaluate the whole auxiliary lane project. I think it jeopardizes our chances for grants from the state, the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. The last round granted about one out of three applicants. It's a competitive grant system. And they have guidelines that include 
effectiveness. If you have a project that's not going to reduce congestion, you're not going to score highly in this round. So it jeopardizes the other projects that are going to be included in that grant application. Thank you for considering. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Yes, Mr. Rock. I'm going to ask you a, I hope, believe it's a reasonable question. We'll see what you think. You just talked about the importance of sort of keeping trust with the voters and sort of letting them know what we're up to and so forth. I know you think, believe that the auxiliary lanes are not helpful and, in fact, dangerous in terms I'm of- I'm just quoting Caltrans. I, I understand <laughs> your source and everything else. Okay. What about the fact that the voters voted for a measure that included those auxiliary lanes? Is, are, or, are, I mean, again, that was a package deal with a bunch of stuff in it. Some of us liked parts of it and didn't like others. A lot of people swallowed hard and said, okay, the overall thing is good enough for this community that I can live with it. What does it mean to the voters that even if you're absolutely correct that they believe they were going to get that and they, whether you think, you know, think Caltrans is right, they have a different view. Isn't there a problem with them holding faith with them on this question? That's yeah, my I question Thank to you for that question. It's really a, a difficult one. I think that the voters were voting for congestion relief. And if you recall, before Measure D got a name, this body approved an over $100,000 expenditure to send a mailer to all voters in the county saying this package is going to relieve congestion on Highway 1. And they were, that was, became Measure D, and they were, what they were referring to as auxiliary lanes. So that it was a disingenuous piece of mail because Caltrans said it wasn't going to relieve congestion. So we have a problem. Now the voters believe what you told them, and now you're saying, well, now we have to honor the voters' opinion. At some point, that, that vicious cycle has to get interrupted by somebody with integrity to say to the voters, I think what you really want is congestion relief, and these auxiliary lanes are not going to do it. But we do have something that will help, which is the bus on the shoulder which does not need auxiliary lanes. It, it, there's a, a myth going on that we have to build auxiliary lanes in order to have bus on shoulder. There's no other place in the country that has bus on shoulder that runs it in auxiliary lanes. It's always a, uh, a lane dedicated to buses. So that's what I think somebody's going to need to tell the voters at some point. Thank you, Mike. Did you get this? Uh, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Um, I did oh, pretty much everything what Rick Longinati said. Um, also to add to those comments, uh, there's been people on the commission and also other people in other areas of uh, politics that has, have said to me they know the ox lanes are not going to work. Um, and that's all more I'll say. Rick m made it very clear how we feel at, at campaign. Um, I don't want to just reiterate, I want to thank Mr. Preston here and also Jock for uh, mentioning that you're going to take the time to look at this um, section of 25B in the Measure D uh, to give you the proper guidelines to actually shift money. It takes care of a lot of issues that may come up that uh, hopefully things don't go to litigation, which we don't like and which you guys don't like either. And so it's just a very easy way to just to really get past this and then move on with whatever you have to do with your funds. Uh, I looked at the replacement page and out of the $29 million that's going to uh, be spent in the next four to five years, uh, half of that, about $14 million, was going to go for the project uh, that is not even in the Measure D. And I thought that was a little bit uh, disingenuous. Um, basically, as a taxpayer, I'm concerned using our monies without going out through this proper procedure of Measure D uh, to find requirements for shifting the funds. Um, there's also another Section 26 I have to read to you because I can't remember things as well as I usually have been able to. It's called Maintenance of Effort. Uh, it basically says the entities receiving measure revenues, which would be the RTC, shall maintain their existing commitment of discretionary local transportation related expenditures for transportation purpose pursuant or in accordance to this ordinance. So there's a couple areas that actually say you need to take some time to figure this out and, and really follow the procedures. Um, we don't agree with what you're doing with the Ox Lane project, but we would just like you to follow what we voted for. Thank you. I have a quick question for you. How's Jack doing? Oh, Jack's doing pretty well. Um, as you all know, he had some prostate issues with cancer. Uh, he's still working uh, with Sierra Club and on the transportation. 
thing. And I did give him the message that you'd like to talk to him. You bet. On that. Okay. But health-wise, he's doing very well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Good morning, Commissioners. David Date from La Salva Beach. Um, I, we just celebrated holidays at our house, and I was thinking my daughter's 10, and she's at the age where she doesn't really believe in Santa Claus. Um, it, we never really spoke about it. It's just kind of this untold thing. Um, and I was thinking you know, at a very young age, she realized that there were limits to what she could ask from Santa Claus. She couldn't ask for you know, a four-wheel drive RC car. She couldn't ask for these things because we couldn't afford them. But we didn't need to explain that to her. She understood that. When I look at this report, especially in sections on the rail trail, we realize that we have $8 million secured for segments eight and nine. We need $26 million to complete that section. Segments 10 through 12, we have $4 million secured. We need $62 million to complete that. So when I look at these numbers, I, I realize this isn't really a plan. No one knows where this money is going to come from. And time after time, every month we show up and we vote these things through when there's no feasibility finding. A plan suggests that we know how we're going to do it. And there's no money here. So we need to reconsider the whole thing. So please consider that in your vote. And maybe we can send this back to staff and come back with something that works for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Sarnataro from Live Oak. Um, there is a promise in this, in Measure D, that the rail corridor would be used. However, the whole idea that rail could actually be afforded with the kind of funds that Measure D had was always impossible. And at some point, it really needs to be communicated to the public that it is rail or trail or rail or paved service, surface. And that in the meantime, people are just going to see the same rusty, unused place where their children or themselves could go and actually have some level of safe movement throughout this otherwise relatively unsafe city in terms of bicycles. So. I don't have anything specific for you. I would say that there is a silent majority out there that would like to see something done. And I do think that there's a disconnect between things like telling uh, uh, Big Tree Lumber that they're going to get uh, some sort of uh, freight service and what it actually takes to make that happen. So. Nothing else to say. We've been through this battle quite a bit over the last couple of years. And the uh, so far, what the record is, is the rusty rails that you see. Thanks. Another presentation? I have a slide. Sorry, you guys. I had a schedule, though, right? Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brian Peoples, uh, Executive Director of Trail Now. Um, we supported Me Measure D. We were big supporters, and we commend the staff on the good report uh, plan. Um, we created this matrix to give an overall cost of the entire rail corridor segments 1 through 20, and we can see a lot of gaps, in, in not only in having actual plan, but having um, the money to fund all of it. Um, 
we believe that it's important to have, this shows that there is no way of having a continuous trail. It's not possible. And we want the RTC to look at maybe some short-term solutions um, because as we discussed early on during the oral communications, key transportation connectors are, are very important and that's what the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail is. So what we're offering up is a platform trail concept which will meet that short-term uh, requirement. It's a prefab engineered system that we've been discussing with Progressive Rail to partner with them on this concept. What we're, we're offering up, and we're offering actually to pay for it, um, is a working, a private public relationship. We've actually been talking to the PUC. And we've also actually had the attorney who represents Progressive Rail on national issues. And what we're proposing is possible and viable, and it meets all the legal requirements. Um, so again, what we're looking for is a short-term solution um, that we believe will enable us to start using the rail corridor today as an alternative to the cars. We really need to open that up. This solution will not require the removal of the tracks. It will allow us to keep the tracks, manage the tracks, um, and it supports your long-term plans. We're not pulling the tracks up. You come along, you put your trail in alongside of it, you shift the tracks over. We're still partnering with them. We're paying for it. Really, this is this the comp the compromise. I can't say compromise. that. Compromise. Compromise. Thank you. The compromise for all of us. We've been battling it. This is the compromise. Not only is it we're not asking for the money, we're offering it up, and it will save you a lot of money on maintaining that corridor. So we're, we're hopeful that um, you do look at short-term solution and you do support Progressive Rail's partnership with us. They're, they're in on it with us. They, um, they're trying to make a business out of the freight operations. Their CEO had to come back. The bank required him to come back because they're a short line operation. It's difficult business. Thank you very much. Staff, take down the last person's presentation. We have it already. I'm asking if you could take it off of the view. Oh. Another person speaking on some other topic. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Largue, a resident of uh, Felton. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, commissioners and staff. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I can't say enough how much I respect your service to the community and the public. Uh, the, the path you've chosen is not an easy one, and, uh, and yet it is the best way to make the world a better place, as far as I can tell, and I want to thank you for all your hard work on that. <clears throat> the, um, the reason I'm here today is in regard to the uh, a uh, relatively small portion of the Measure D funds uh, related to uh, Highway 9 in the San Lorenzo Valley. The, um, uh, this is non-controversial. I don't know that anyone opposes anything we're trying to do there. And it's all a matter of how do we make it work? How do we make it work for the community, for Caltrans as the owner of the right-of-way and the Highway 9 facilities? And uh, how do we make it feasible given the extremely challenging technical situation that we have there uh, in a narrow canyon uh, lined by schools and homes and with a 20,000 vehicle per day corridor running through the middle of it. <clears throat> um, I want to uh, simply say I, I encourage you to step on the gas. Let's keep, keep moving, keep pushing things forward. The Measure D expenditure plan uh, is a bit concerning in that um, the period it covers I think uh, by the end of it, we'll be eight years into Measure D, uh, and yet, uh, so that's almost a third of the duration of Measure D, but we will only have spent 10% of the funds for the Highway 9 corridor, and uh, that's concerning in that the, um, the issues are, are fairly urgent. There have been fatalities along the cor corridor related to pedestrian and bicyclists. The school district will not have a bike to school day because it's too unsafe. 
Um, and there's an opportunity here to, to move things forward. And I urge you to move things forward as quickly as possible and, and accelerate things to the extent feasible. Uh, related to this, um, though somewhat distinct, is that the uh, allocation for funding for uh, the Highway 9 corridor is odd in that it is a fixed sum, as described. It's a $10 million fixed sum, whereas all of the other allocations are a percentage of total revenues. The implication of this uh, is that one of the calendars for apportioning funding to the Highway 9 corridor splits out those $10 million evenly over 30 years. Uh, 30 years out, a dollar will be worth about 50 cents as a result of inflation. Uh, the implication of, of not having a percentage allocation for, uh, for Highway 9 means that uh, about $3 million of the 10 will erode away uh, due to inflation. Uh, in contrast, uh, all of the other uh, uh, allocations are a, a percentage amount. So I urge you to reconsider how that allocation is made. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Sally Arnold, board chair of Friends and the Rail Trail. Um, we are pleased to see a plan for implementation of the Major D projects, um, especially, of course, the rail and trail. Um, but, um, and we understand people's frustrations about how slow things are. I was thinking about it as I was listening to, you know, that discussion, how, I don't know about your house, but at my house, there is no project too small to not require at least three trips to the hardware store. I mean, it's just the way building things and fixing things goes. And um, on this grander scale, you know, it's particularly, frustrating, but we understand that that's, that's how it happens. We've noticed that the cost estimates for many of the projects in all the categories are significantly higher than their previous estimates, and, and we understand you know, that that's how things go sometimes. Um, we are very excited, of course, that actually there's going to be another segment of the trail breaking ground this month, and um, as uh, Mr. Preston already, uh, you know, in, mentioned to you, you know, we really invite everybody to come to the groundbreaking party on the 25th over by the railroad tracks um, on, um, at the Santa Cruz Mountain Brewery so we can celebrate some progress happening. Um, and it was very heartened to hear Mr. Preston explaining the complex funding system and ways in which small amounts of money can be leveraged for larger amounts of money and that the... Um, and the, and the idea that, you know, it takes a while to get every project in the chute, but we're now entering that period of time when things are gonna be built, and that's very exciting. Um, we do have a concern that in the rail corridor analysis of options, um, the project fact sheet, that's page 89 and 90, it says the RTC will likely need to secure additional grant funds for feasibility and environmental work. And our understanding was that Major D explicitly provides funds for feasibility and environmental design of passenger rail transit, as well as funds to maintain the rail line in a functional condition. So Major D men's funds are meant to cover the project development work in order to make the project's construction the projects construction ready and thus potentially available for those uh, state and federal funds. So we were uh, concerned about that. And, you know, and then in light of, the, you know, some other cost overruns that we've discussed, we're wondering that the plan to add a new project to Measure D, you know, those, those ox lanes past uh, State Park Drive to Freedom, seems to us that that adds an additional burden to Measure D and maybe it's already oversubscribed. And so we would like you to just consider that um, as you're, you know, making plans for what you're going to spend this Major D money on. And thank you all for your support for getting all these important transportation projects happening in our county. Anyone else would like to speak to some of the public? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't see any others that want to speak to us. I'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion. Mr. Schifrin. I just wanted to remind the commission that the staff recommendation is that we not take action today, that we really hear from the public and um, have this come back at our next meeting to take action on it. So I, um, I would suggest that people who testified, who had suggestions or proposals, maybe submit them in writing so that they could be evaluated by staff and that maybe staff respond at the next some of the public comments and suggestions that were made, but that the point mm -hmm. that we sort of try to encourage them to do so. Yeah, uh, you know, sort of encourage ourselves to hold our comments till next time, and <laughs> I have to hear them a second time. 
Thank you, Mr. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rodkin, not Mr. Johnson. Some, <laughs> some of the people uh, commenting from the public might not have been here uh, earlier in the meeting when uh, our, our executive director explained uh, his experience in Sonoma County where he was able to get five to one matching for transportation projects. I'm going to point out, of course, you can't guarantee that that success will be transferred here. Uh, but it's worth noting that that happened before SB1 even uh, was in, in place. Um, so the comments, there were several of them, and in writing as well in the submissions, that, you know, we have an unrealistic plan here because it's not fully funded, because there's these huge gaps. And these are big numbers. They're huge. You know, we're talking millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Um, so I understand people's questioning the issue of, like, you know, how realistic is our plan to get this, to leverage these funds? Um, but I do think, um, given that we do have a comment from our executive director that doesn't seem out of place at all, and that it's not just pie in the sky, but based on his actual experience working in another county, um, that people who um, think that, the, you know, that this is unrealistic need to do something more to persuade us that we're just like you know, idiots flying into the future with no idea where we're going. Because I'm feeling pretty confident that we've got a plan that could work, well work. There's no guarantees. You're taking certain kinds of risks. But the alternative being that we would have a, a, a transportation plan that doesn't meet the needs of this county doesn't seem very attractive when there's at least realistic basis for hoping that it's going to work well. So I wanted to respond to those comments rather than pretend like we're ignoring them or didn't hear them or something. We've heard them over and over again. But I think the onus is on the people making those comments to suggest why we're being unrealistic about this when we have every reason to think it's a very realistic approach to where we're going. Thank you. And I appreciate Randy asking the question that got that answer. I, I'd, I'd like um, to mention, um, I, I think it is good we're, we're going to hear more next month, month on this, but you know, Measure D passed in November of 2016. It wasn't until just what, less, a little less than a half year later that SB1 passed. So how we can make that mix and match to the, the biggest benefit of for the, the motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians in Santa Cruz County, uh, we had to look at that too that was new we weren't sure that sb1 as a matter of fact that was a years long str uh, struggle up in sacramento so we're trying to see how we can mix and match and leverage as was mentioned as best we can with something that wasn't in place when the voters passed measure d so i think that has something to do with the way we're looking at this at this point this year compared to november of 2016. Any other comments, Mr. So are Caput? We gonna, are we going to vote on this? No, we're not going to vote today on it. We're just going to uh, receive uh, this uh, uh, impl implementation plan. We're going to discuss it and make a, presumably a, de uh, a decision next month on how to proceed. No, so, I, uh, yeah, we don't need a motion on this at this point. I would I, make I, a motion I, I to continue. That, but that I, you make, make a motion to, to continue. Direct staff to re, um, return with a response to some of the comments that were raised. Second. Yeah, second. Okay. We have what I'm getting at here is uh, we have a resolution in front of us, right? Not on this. No. 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 We do not. We don't. Next month we're going to. Next month we will. <laughs> so it was moved by Schifrin, second by Gonzalez. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 So ordered. And thank you for the input again from the public. Very important for us to consider. Item number 20: the Transit Corridor Alternative Analysis Communications and Stakeholder Involvement Plan. Go into uh, Sh Shannon Muntz. Pretty in the folder. I know. Maybe. Save me. Good morning, Commissioners. Shannon Munns, I'm the Communications Specialist on your staff. So I'm here today to ask you to provide input on and approve the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis Communication Stakeholder and Involvement Plan. In November 2019, the RTC, in partnership with Metro and the HDR consultant team, began work to identify future options for high-capacity public transit on the Santa Cruz County Branch Rail Line through the Transit Corridor Alternatives Analysis. To ensure that to the greatest extent possible, interagency consultation and public participation is an, are an integral part of this process, we developed a communications and stakeholder involvement plan. 
This plan will guide our outreach process and it lays out the engagement strategy at each milestone of the project. It also identifies target audiences for us to do outreach to, as well as outreach objectives, strategies, and tactics. So there are three key technical milestones where outreach will be done to the public to ensure awareness, education, and input is sought at the right times. Okay, so these are the three milestones that we will be doing robust outreach around. Uh, milestone one, the goals, screening criteria, performance measures, and initial alternatives. At this milestone, we'll gather input on the initial universe of alternatives that are going to be looked at. We'll also get input on the draft screening criteria and performance measures that will be used. Uh, milestone two, the screened alternatives. At this point, we will share the alternative screening process results and highlight the narrowed down alternatives. So from the first milestone, the list will be narrowed down. And we'll gather input on that short list of alternatives to be considered. At milestone three, the preferred analysis results and locally preferred alternative. That milestone will highlight the analysis process that we used on the short list of alternatives, share performance measure results, and then seek input on the locally preferred alternative that we had narrowed down to. So for each milestone, we have four tiers of outreach that we'll be doing. So milestone one, we'll start with uh, tier one will be outreach to our agency partners. That includes the alternatives analysis ad hoc committee, which is made up of three members of your commission and three members of the Metro board our RTC advisory committees, and our partner agencies. So for this outreach, we'll be do present, doing presentations at scheduled meetings for all of those organizations. And then miles, or I'm sorry, tier two will be outreach to our stakeholder groups. And these are community organizations, business organizations, all different types of organizations around the community that we will be doing focus groups with. Um, we broke this down into two groups, the stakeholder groups. Group one will be doing focus groups with representatives from our Spanish-speaking advocacy groups, faith-based organizations, human services organizations, and low-income and minority groups. And then our focus group two will consist of representatives from business associations, chambers, major employers throughout the county, advocacy groups for bike, ped, youth, elderly, disabled, and environmental, educational and healthcare institutes, and then neighborhood groups. And for these focus group meetings, we will have meetings in Watsonville and Santa Cruz. And then that would take us to tier three, which will be outreach to the general public. At this point, we'll be hosting open house meetings in both Santa Cruz and Watsonville. We'll be doing very robust online outreach via social media, email, our website, as well as newspaper, bus, radio ads, maybe tabling at events with flyers and fact sheets. Um, just a lot of outreach to, for people that can't come to those open houses to make sure that we're getting the word out that this is the opportunity to provide input. And then that would take us to tier four, RTC and Metro. At this point, we would take all of the input we received to the Metro board to receive their input and then back here to you all to receive your input and approval. So that's milestone one. Milestone two, very similar to milestone one. We would start with our agency partners and presentations at their meetings. Our stakeholder groups, at this point with the stakeholder groups, we would reach out to those representatives that came to the focus group meetings via email and provide them the opportunity and everything they need to provide us input via email. For the general public outreach at this stage, we will have a public hearing at an RTC meeting, and then again, do very robust online outreach and outreach through ads, tabling, and things like that. Um, and then again, RTC and Metro, we would take the information we get at that milestone to Metro to receive input, and then to you all for input and approval. And then milestone three, again, very similar. We would start with our agency partners move to the stakeholder groups and reach out via email again to the stakeholder groups at this point. For the general public for Milestone 3, we would again host two um, open houses, one in Watsonville and one in Santa Cruz, and then do the robust online outreach ads, all of those things to get people uh, that can't come to those open houses aware that we are taking input at this point. And then again, we would end with bringing all of that back to Metro to receive input and then to you all for your 
input and approval. So in December, we brought this plan to the Alternatives Analysis Ad Hoc Committee and received input from them. And today, we're here seeking your input and approval on the plan. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on the plan at this time. Yes, Ms. Gomez. Thank you. Um, I guess I have some things lined up for you. Um, I'm not hearing anything about schools. Um, I, I, and the, you know, basically, we're looking at some of this as being a generational kind of a project. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'd like to see that we're engaging either UCSC, Cabrillo College, yes. PVUSD. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, the stakeholder groups, f the focus group two, would consist of educational institutions. And we have a list of all of the school districts. We'll reach out to all of them the colleges, university. So that is part of the stakeholder focus group two list. Yes. And city council, of course, is the, the bodies that you're going to be coming and presenting to so that that's also another media form for the yes. information. Yes, we will. Um, it's not exactly in the plan, but our plan is to come to all of the city councils and present as well. So that is something we are we do have on the agenda to do. Um, the other thing, and it wasn't specific up here, is the like a farmer's market. Yeah, we have it at Cabrillo. We have it downtown Watsonville. Yeah. Will we have tables that will be at that uh, the, at those venues or when we have things that are, are social events down in our communities? Yes. So we table at a lot of events throughout the year just aside from this. Um, we will continue to do that. And when we have outreach opportunities, we do look for other places that we can table. So we will be looking at all types of those events. But um, in any given year, we table, I don't know, 15, 15 to 20 events throughout the year. And so um, if we do have something specific we're doing outreach for, we will look for other opportunities to enhance that. Yeah. And my last question is timeline. W mm -hmm. What are we looking at in the next 30, 60, 90 days or when we're looking at re return results? So milestone one will begin outreach in February. Um, we do have dates nailed down. Um, ten, I think they're pretty solid, the dates in February for the outreach. Um, but we're looking at February 5th for focus group meetings and then the 11th and 12th for the open houses. Um, but we should have that nailed down, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, specifically, I just um, and maybe it's just taken for granted, but just to target um, some agencies that um, serve the disabled community. Uh, I'd just like to have them included in each of these groups. I didn't know that. I think it should be specifically identified that we want to have them. Uh, aware of this too. I'm yes, probably you we are, do have that as part of the focus groups. Um, focus group two, we're specifically going to target advocacy groups for elderly and disabled. Um, focus group one will be doing human services organizations and things like that. So we do have a very robust list of those organizations that we will be reaching out and inviting them to our focus groups. Very good. Yeah. Any other questions from the well, I would just say that as a member of the all, this uh, ad hoc group, uh, the outreach was something that we talked about at, at, at some length <clears throat> and the importance of doing it well to make sure it's reflective of the community. So I appreciate the comments. We'll take that all back, too. Any other questions from the board? Uh, any questions from the <clears throat> public? Everyone coming? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, we, uh, we've been looking very closely at this because, of course, we're very eager to be part of this discussion. And um, I'm really excited to hear some dates come out. That was, one of the, that was my main concern when I read the document. It seems so general. And, um, you know, we, uh, we need plenty of notice. You know, if the public is going to participate meaningfully, um, we need to have plenty of notice of public events. We, uh, if you really want to engage the community, there needs to be lots of lead time, both for online input and in-person participation. Um, you know, sometimes input is solicited in a really short time window, um, or announcing it a public event is announced only a few days before the event and doesn't really allow time for the public to participate. Um, so we hope that um, we'll get more specific dates or even just months. I mean, I understand that, you know, maybe they haven't reserved, you know, the room for their 
event on February 11th yet, so they're not sure or whatever, but even just some months, some clue as to when these things are happening so that we can plan. And the more specific the calendar, the more useful it's going to be, um, and you'll get more actual meaningful participation. Thank you. Manu Koenig, candidate for First District Supervisor, and I ran a polling and survey research company for nine years. I did not see anything on this outreach schedule that would be statistically representative. It's not representative of the general community to just hold a workshop, which maybe some people can attend in the evening, maybe some people can't. It's not representative of the community to put out an online survey to the people who are already receive email from this group. So if you really want a representative survey, you've got to be talking about phone polling or door-to-door -door outreach polling. The other thing is, how are you going to use this information? One of the largest surveys that I saw in the Unified Corridor study showed very clearly that the majority of people do not want to train, and they want the trail. And yet, there was no discussion anywhere in the Unified Corridor study of how you were actually listening to the public and how that would influence the choices that you ultimately made. So this entire schedule is useless unless you are very explicit about how it's going to impact the results. And finally, are you going to ask about funding? We know, yes, sure, five to one funding, matching funds, great. We don't have funding today locally for passenger rail service. We look uh, to Sonoma and Marin counties. They have to pass a new sales tax in order to fund the smart train. Are you going to actually ask the public if they have any appetite to fund a local sales tax measure or parcel tax measure that would fund rail or that would fund even improve metro service or bus service? These are the questions you've got to ask if you want an effective public outreach. Without them, this is just a joke. Thank you. Uh, Michael Saint, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Quick question. I saw that this was going to be put out to Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Is it Santa Cruz County or the city of Santa Cruz? Is there anything going to be done uh, outreach-wise in Mid-County? Because, yes. okay, good. There's my answer. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. Happy New Decade. Here we are, rocking and rolling. Uh, I'm excited about the alternative analysis, and I'm curious about where uh, the Friends of the Rail and Trail might be. Are they part of a stakeholder focus group or a member of the general public? Uh, hopefully, we're part of a focus group. And I noticed in the scoping uh, of the RFP that was sent out to the consultants back a few months ago. Milestone outreach plan dates shall be integrated into the task one schedule deliverables. When I read that, I said, okay, they're going to come out with a plan for public outreach, and we're going to have dates assigned to it so we can prepare. Um, there's a lot of people in the community that are interested in this project, and you know, a two-week notice just isn't adequate. So I hope that uh, you can ask your staff for some specific dates for these public outreach events uh, and those uh, times when it's going to be coming back to the commission. So. Uh, that, those are my comments. Um, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, bring it back to any further discussion. Yes, Mr. Schiffer. Yes, I was on the um, alternative analysis task force, and um, I, the contract does have dates in it, and I think maybe it was an oversight not to put dates or at least expected dates into the staff report if they're not there. I agree that it's important that as much uh, prior notice is, is given um, to the public so that members of the public can participate. And I think that, that's certainly been the intention all along. So um, I, th uh, I appreciate the comments being made. And um, I think maybe the, the staff working on it and the consultants can maybe be a little bit more informative about getting the, the, the timeline out. Some of it is going to be a little, have to be a little flexible because the ability to move to step two, milestone <coughs> two, depends on the outcome of milestone one and how much uh, time the commission needs, the transit board needs, and 
what the results of the input are. I did want to respond to a couple of comments about how that input is going to be used and the notion that the input during the corridor study was ignored. I mean, we've got, I remember getting huge amounts of information from the consultants and from our staff about what various members of the public were saying and what the kind of participation, uh, the responses to the participation. There were people who didn't like what the commission ultimately did, but that doesn't mean that the commission didn't consider a huge amount of, of input from a, a wide variety of, uh, of participants in the process. And I think that's the intention here. This is a very extensive public outreach plan. And what it's going to do, and I, I assume that it will, the result, the way it's going to work is the same way it worked with the Unified Corridor Study, that the commission and the transit board will get information about what comes out of the online, uh, the online comments, the stakeholder meetings, the public meetings. We'll get plenty of information about where uh, where people are uh, are coming from so I think it's it's incorrect to uh, uh, assert that one the Commission didn't take input seriously when it looked at the uh, unified court when it considered the unified corridor study or that this uh, current process is a joke um, in terms of the the attempt by the Commission to hear from the public and give lots of opportunities for, for public input. The other thing that I think is important to uh, mention is this notion of the financing. Uh, obviously, we don't know where the, uh, you know, what the proposed alternative is going to be uh, or alternatives are going to be. And, you know, we had this whole discussion about uh, in the previous item about the leveraging of, of funding. But one of the things that's been a critical component of the contract with this consultant is that what comes back is a feasibility analysis and what this commission and the transit board are looking for are financially feasible alternatives that are also acceptable to the public. So the idea that this is all a pie in the sky exercise uh, in futility is really counter to what the whole purpose of the alternative analysis is all about. It's to get the commission and the transit board working together to seek a, uh, an option for transit on the rail corridor that is financially feasible. Um, how that's going to work, what it's going to be, there's no way to know now. That's what this process is going to end up with. But I think it's important to emphasize that the, that the goal and the objective of it all is to come up with a, with a, feasible, uh, with a feasible option for the two bodies to consider. <clears throat> Leopold. Uh, thank you. I uh, support the comments made by uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Schifrin. I think he hit the nail on the head. I note <laughs> the irony that uh, uh, from a speaker uh, who asked us to do an alternative analysis along with the Metro, now criticizing us for doing that uh, uh, very alternative analysis, you know, uh, at, and then criticizing us for not having done what the people asked us to. Um, that just shows you that there's a moving of goalposts that happens a lot with transportation discussions. And you have to be clear that not getting what you want is not, doesn't mean that we didn't listen. It means that we looked at all the information and made a decision. Um, we're going to look at all the information here, working with our partner at the Transit District, to ultimately make the best decision for what we want to see is for high capacity transit on the corridor. Um, it will be useful. We haven't committed. To, to a mode of transportation, and we're doing this outreach. I think the RTC staff has increasingly done a better job of doing outreach. Now we've, we've, we've gone out, our, our RTP uh, uh, several years back was uh, a lot of public input. We, the, the Measure D campaign was a lot of uh, input, the Unified Corridor Study. And, you know, when you go to a meeting and there's 50 to 75 people there, that's pretty good showing for uh, a, a meeting. Um, and if you're reaching out to all these different groups, of which I mentioned we have <clears throat> talked with the staff to ensure that it actually happens and to reach the diverse uh, community, uh, we're going to make an honest effort to incorporate those voices within the choices that we make here. So I appreciate the work that the staff and I 
appreciate the work on the the ad hoc committee to keep uh, oversight of that, about this and report back to the board as often as possible. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. So. Um, I, th I think you kind of make the point of the speaker in some ways, though, um, Mr. Leopold, from the standpoint that, you know, there are 50 to 75 people at a meeting, but there are 275,000 people in the county. So um, as much as the outreach is um, good intentions, and I think a lot of the um, information that comes out of it is uh, most helpful, uh, there's a certain amount of insider where uh, kind of the same people show up with their preconceived notions of trying to, uh, you know, implement their ideas versus uh, actually getting a, 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 a full spectrum of what people really feel. And I think it is fair from the standpoint that a lot of people, and if, you know, if you look at, you know, Measure D, moving Santa Cruz County forward, um, there were a lot of expectations and the, the feeling among uh, and with respect to where is the money going to come from, um, a lot of people felt that a half cent sales tax back in, in 2016 was going to be enough to do all the things in this, you know, big, you know, five, six, seven point um, of bucket, I guess there were five buckets uh, that was going to get accomplished. And so asking the people if they're prepared with respect in, in this particular case for, for a train, um, which is not, you know, tens of millions or scores of millions, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions. Um, and uh, I think people have a right to know and at least be asked the question if, you know, it's one thing to say this is what we want, but the other question out there is, is this what we want to pay for and are we willing to pay for it? So. Um, I'm kind of in the middle. I appreciate the fact that this is a very comprehensive outreach, but at the same time, I'm willing to listen to people that say, look, um, we need something more extensive that reflects the true feelings and, and at least uh, an outreach that reaches more people rather than the 50 or 75 that you describe. To be clear, I wasn't suggesting that we would only reach to 50 or 75, but when you hold public meetings and a lot of people come out, there's not a room big enough for 275,000 people. Um, and if we, if we look at, uh, at uh, public outreach, there's no illusion that we're reaching 275,000 people. We are trying to reach uh, lots of people who are interested in this subject, and there's no doubt that people come to this with their own preconceived notions. But we're trying to reach into the community and provide good information to, to solicit input. And uh, we have to get... Uh, public agencies should always be committed to doing that, and I appreciate the work that the staff is doing to try to go out and make that happen. Mr. Rotkin. So I'm going to speak for a moment as a professional that does research on the public opinion. Um, the idea that if you simply do a survey and ask everybody out there, you know, through whatever means you reach them with the survey, a phone call or a knock on their door, gives you better information than the kind of outreach plan that we have here is very deeply mis mistaken. Um, People need to be informed in order to give you an opinion about various kinds of things. And the studies that we're doing in the process of doing this, in which we get closer and closer to what really might be possible, allows people to give you feedback. At some point, some people are not going to get engaged. They're going to sit back and wait to see what happens. The people that care about this, that have any strong views about it one way or the other, are being given many, many opportunities here in a variety of ways to respond to us about what their concerns are. I'm sure we'll be getting letters to the editor in addition to anything we do that come in in terms of what's supposed to happen. But somehow the idea that we're not reaching people if we don't ask them each, each of the 200, well, then some of them are children below the age of responding, but that each of these, you know, like over 100,000 people that we'd like to hear from are going to get back to us with informed opinion that would actually allow us to make a better decision, I think is deeply misguided. Bertrand. So I appreciate the difference between those who show up at public meetings in a sense, they're the most active. They may be the most informed, but also recognize that if we're going to pay for things, we need to get a broader sense of what the community feels about a particular issue. And as you just said, Mike, um, it's our duty to inform the public. And when we reach out to the public based on that information, I think it's our duty also to get a representative sample of the people who live in this community. Thanks. Any other questions from? I'd move oh, yes, the staff Mr. recommendation on this item. Second. 
By Schifrin, second by Brown. And let me just yes. emphasize um, that what the goal here with this study is to come up with a feasible, alter financially feasible alternative that's acceptable to both the transit district and this commission. And, you know, all of our meetings are in public. The outreach has, has a number of meetings, both at this body, the transit district, um, and as well as the city councils. So the general public at large is going to have, certainly through press releases and reportage, knowledge of what's going on. And I think this, at least in my experience, this commission definitely gets to hear from members of the public um, on all different sides of it. And I think, you know, ultimately, if there is, a f if there is an alternative that can be done within existing financial resources, it won't be necessary to go back to the public and ask for more money. If that isn't feasible, then we're going to get a representative sample because we're going to have to get a two-thirds vote for any additional funding for, for some kind of a project. It's just premature to jump to that at this time. I think what we're trying to do here, at least from my perspective, is carry out a good faith effort to look at alternatives hear from the public, uh, the interested public, uh, um, and give uh, lots of opportunities for pub the members of the public and those with specific concerns to weigh in on this process, and then come up with uh, hopefully a, a, a couple of, a few alternatives, and then ultimately uh, an al uh, one alternative that both these the transit district and the commission can feel that they want to pursue in terms of following the unanimous decision of the commission on the unified corridor study which was to allow high uh, to allow transit on the rail corridor that was a decision that was made okay um mr johnson just real quick i wanted to know uh, chair um we never uh, assigned a price tag to this study do we know how much it's going to cost uh, the alternatives analysis what uh, we're talking about here yes um, we did uh, provide that information when we approved the contract I believe the consultant contract was in the neighborhood of um, mid sixes 660,000 somewhere around there and then staff costs and additional um, expenses were a few hundred thousand dollars so it was just under a million dollars for the alternatives analysis study when uh, you include all the costs I would just, uh, to, uh, to addend uh, my colleague's remarks, which I thought were very well stated, we are looking at a triple bottom line, and it's not just finances. We are looking at uh, the economics, uh, its impact on the environment, and its impact on equity in our county. That is what we committed to when the RFP that we sent out, and that's how we're going to judge it. The economics will be important, um, but w we're looking at these other measures as well to make sure that the community needs are met. Mr. Bertrand. Um, thank you, Mr. Schifrin. I appreciate your comments and the laying out the sequence of events, I think, is very important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Okay. Unanimously all know. I mean, unanimously all Oh, know. unanimously. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, the next RTC meeting is scheduled for Thursday, February 6th at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chamber. Um, this meeting is adjourned.